good to be here today to to share uh, to share my story. So, as the title suggests, I'm going to trace my evolution from uh, photographer to photo studio to building central studios in China to where we are today, uh, boutique content production one stop. Um, so. Uh, uh, it's been a great evolution to have a front seat of uh, everything that's been going on in China and, uh, you know, the pace of change, not only for China, but the industry uh, has been great. So it's been good to, to rise with the tide here. Um, so my journey starts as a photographer and I've always loved photography. Um, uh, before coming to China, I had a small practice in Sydney and I traveled around a lot and um, uh, I had a particularly uh, tough year in 2004. And right at the end of that year, I got an invitation to participate in a Tourism Australia exhibition that traveled through China and the rest of Asia. So the first stop was Beijing and then Shanghai. Um, at the time, I was traveling around, I had a small practice in Sydney, a small studio, and I used to drive up the coast and, and uh, through, the, through the bush and take a lot of landscape shots. So it was my landscape work that was uh, invited to appear. Having never been to China, uh, I'd been hearing rumblings about China and the growth of China at the time. And uh, I decided that I would go and check it out for myself. So it wasn't long before the landscape changed to something like this. And I managed to uh, do a little contra deal at the time with a, with a Chinese tourism operator who put me on a boat on a tourism barge up the Yangtze River in exchange for some photo photographs of, uh, of the Chinese landscape. Now, this probably wasn't the shot she was going to use, but I was overstruck by the scale of this project at the time. And uh, this is the Three Gorges Dam. And to give you an idea really of the scale, uh, this probably tells a better story where going through the uh, lock, um, we can see just how big this project is. Uh, while we were there, we had to, we got to walk around the surrounding uh, parts and just overlooking the dam was this little monument. And I was, I was really quite awestruck and, and curious to watch this scene unfold before me, where one by one, all the tourists came up and took a photo, an identical photo in front of this monument. And uh, coming from Australia, where, where we have such, such a big space and so few people, and everyone really is always trying to get their own unique view, it was curious how one by one, they all took exactly the same photo. And it was, it was just to kind of say that they'd been there and they were proud of this uh, engineering feat. So little did I know that this would become the basis for a personal series that I would embark on. So after arriving in China in 2005, the first couple of years was spent as a photographer. And I just walked around, uh, or so I said, traveled around uh, as many places as I could go to when in between jobs or in between projects and shooting with my Mamiya RZ67 and with some out of stock Agfa Ultra 50 film that I managed to find in Hong Kong. I traveled to all these places and, and try to emulate what I saw uh, at that at the Three Gorges Dam overlooking the dam by by finding these people and, and people that were willing to, to stand in my photos and, and document them with a more formal portrait. Uh, so um, it was quite amazing to see that wherever I went, this practice was, was just such a familiar ritual for all the locals. And, and as China developed, you know, more and more people traveled and they were proud to, to go and see their country. In Shanghai, I always like to travel around the city, finding unusual places such as how people did their, uh, enjoy their recreation. Uh, coming from Australia, I was fascinated with water and the use of pools. Here's a wave pool in Shanghai. But the, their love of uh, water really spread across the country. And whenever we went to any distant provinces, we would, um, I would look for uh, pools or, or something where I could get uh, other shots in this series. Uh, this shot was taken in Urumuchi in Xinjiang, 
and uh, this was where I was sort of experimenting more with painting in the elements of a photo. So while it looks like a perfectly natural scene, it was a it was a nice experiment in, in creating this vibrant pool scene. Uh, so this was 2009, and actually, as a side note, unfortunately, uh, a couple of days after we left here, there were some riots that broke out, so we were lucky to, to get out when we did. Um, so that brings us to 2009, and in 2009 was also when we opened the photo studio. So I opened the studio with, uh, with my partner, um, who is now my wife, and together we were sort of sitting there and looked at each other when the opportunity to come and look at the space came through and we sort of looked at each other and said well what are we going to do in China if we're not going to try something big so here is uh, what our studios looked like before it was a car park it was a whole ground floor of the building and um, from lease signing to opening it took us three months because I'd already had the business plan ready to go we were going to I was going to do it with a previous partner uh, um, in the previous year, but the financial crisis came, so everything got put on hold. And before long, within three months, all of a sudden, uh, the studios were open. So uh, it actually took us by surprise how quickly we built it. And all of a sudden, we were opened our doors and we're like, okay, well, what do we do now? So we had to go out and get the customers. Um, it didn't take long for uh, the word to get around. And before long, it was the place to shoot where we had uh, all of uh, the top photographers, anyone that would come from Beijing would come and shoot with us. And it was the uh, place to go because we had um, just, just oh, everything was oversized. Everything was big, everything was well catered for. I'd been working as a photographer and was frustrated by the uh, photo studios that I'd worked in. And uh, it was time to kind of give Shanghai an international level uh, facility with all the gear. Uh, when we first opened, uh, a lot of people weren't quite sure how to uh, use the space. Uh, it was bigger than anything they'd seen. Uh, the polyboards were oversized, but it didn't take long for people to, to kind of start to, to experiment and, and use a little bit more. Not only that, uh, when we opened in uh, 2009, the industry was still quite undeveloped. Not, not because people didn't know how to take photos, but it was just still a very old school sort of industry and shooting was, was, wasn't really that uh, adventurous. But then uh, with, the, with the onset of social media, all of a sudden brands had to create a hell of a lot more content. So before long, we found that our studios were really well catered, uh, were, were really well positioned to cater for the uh, increased needs of all of these clients. And all of a sudden, you know, we were having print shoots, photo shoots, everything was, was combined in one and it gave us a lot of flexibility. Uh, early on, uh, throughout, well, really up until the pandemic, we were always getting a steady stream of international visitors and the best photographers in the world would come and visit us from Patrick de Marchelia to Dan Jackson uh, to a lot of top fashion guys, um, as well as, as top international celebrities and sports people. Having the flexibility of a big space, we uh, could easily accommodate uh, uh, combined video and photo shoots, especially where celebrities are concerned and, and where they need to kind of really have a much uh, bigger um, demands in terms of space and security. Before the pandemic, uh, live streaming was already becoming uh, quite massive. And uh, then during COVID and the pandemic, it just accelerated. So one thing was, uh, it wasn't just limited to live streaming. Uh, the social media landscape of China is particularly well suited to live streaming because of the, the e-commerce platforms here, uh, Tmall, Taobao and, and JD and, and all the other new platforms. It's geared towards e-commerce. So there's a natural progression that the studios uh, could easily adapt to uh, cater for these. And of course, you know, having a central downtown location uh, made it really handy. A lot of the brands didn't want to travel to the edge of Shanghai to, to, to these other distant studios. And then if they've got celebrities and then and CEOs coming in, 
it was uh, it made the studios permanently busy with a lot of this sort of stuff over the past few years. Uh, live streaming it's obviously great for brands, great for e-commerce. And uh, you know, as a, as a brand CEO told me, he's like, "Why would I spend a million RMB on production if I can uh, get one of these live streamers and they're going to give me ten million RMB of guaranteed sales uh, for a twenty percent fee?" So their ROI was measurable. So as a result. Um, you know, on one hand, we had the studios and it was great that we could we could get the revenue in the business. But then um, on the other hand, you know, live streaming also proved a bit of a competitive force against what we did as creating um, other kinds of photo and video content. So uh, fortunately, uh, we had another ace up our sleeve, which was our great network of uh, global creatives. And uh, because of the pandemic as well, we all got used to doing remote shoots and virtual shoots uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, so this was a great opportunity for us where we could offer our local clients, our global network, and all from the comfort of our studio in Shanghai, we could uh, watch a shoot. So this is something that uh, was shot in uh, Sydney. Okay, so more than the content we do for our brands, one thing that uh, was always really important to us at Central Studios was community. And we didn't want to just always be about the work. And from 2010, we launched a fair day, which right up until we, we closed was the longest running continuous market day in Shanghai. Uh, and this, this really was a well sought after calendar on the event. It originally started where we would get industry people together and we would get all of the uh, stylists and photographers to come down on the weekend and, and all the stylists would sell all of the Prada and Dior that they got for free. And we had a really cool group of people that was, was uh, the foundation of the inaugural fair day. And, and it just kind of organically grew and to the point where it was really just a, a focus of the social calendar. People were really looking forward to this every year. And uh, music was a feature. We would get some of the, the city's best DJs. And I think on the last time we had the fair day, we had about 5,000 people through on a day. Um, and that was even during the pandemic. So a little bit cheeky, but was a uh, much sought after event. And another thing that the studios were really grateful was screening. Some of you might've seen um, Jonathan from Push Media speak a couple of months ago at, at uh, another event and they created Push Fest which is the first international uh, skate festival and um, as you can see here we had about 500 people in the studio for a screening. Um, screenings were really popular and we, we also implemented our own um, our own sort of program of screenings here with a, with a platform called Open Screen. And this was a way where we would invite young local filmmakers to show their shorts. And we would do this every couple of months and we set up a projection at the studio and um, push it out on our platform. And uh, one way that we reached and engaged the community was through our WeChat channel. And uh, it was always a very popular way to, to spread and, and connect with um, not only just people who liked our events, but also the partners we work with. And, these kind of events was a great opportunity for us to source directors and to really untap some local talent, directors and producers. And, you know, we've met a lot of people at these events who, who then become either people we work with or people we work for on the brand side. Uh, we've always enjoyed learning and we created a program called Industry Matters where we would get industry professionals to come in and share their experience. And, uh, it's uh, run a very intimate workshop for young up and coming uh, creatives. Again, this was also a great source uh, where um, we could find some young fresh recruits for uh, photo assistance. And also we found that the people we got to talk, they loved coming to share. People love sharing their experiences. And here we've got uh, one of the top photographers in Shanghai sharing his black and white portraiture. So unfortunately we did lose the studio to the path of development at the end of last year. And which now sort of makes us, uh, I guess, pivot to, to the final 
um, stage, hopefully not our final stage, but certainly where we are now in the metamorphosis of a boutique content one stop. Um, during the time at Central Studios, we had added services and built up a, a post-production department and a very strong production department. So now, you know, we're really in the position of being an asset creation company for our uh, clients. And with the structural shifts in the business, in the industry, uh, we've had to retool our company a bit to, to deal with the demand. And, and now what's happening in production is uh, clients demanding that production houses uh, obviously offer a little bit of extra creative and um, they want us to kind of give them the full uh, creative workflow from campaign idea to delivery. So now we've retooled the company and we're in a position to really offer that full service. Do good production is a little motto we have. And really it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's more about just doing a great shoot. It's about doing good. It's about, um, you know, doing, doing the right thing for our people, but also the environment and trying to be sustainable where we can and where possible trying to, you know, pick clients and, and work with clients who also um, as, as prescribe to a similar ethos. In terms of our clients here, uh, we still, most of our clients still are multinational, international brands. Um, whereas early on, we might've done a lot of work for international brands being based out of overseas. Really, everything that we do now is, is primarily for the local market. We, uh, we're still working with the big global brands, but just dealing with the local offices, mainly in fashion and luxury, but we also have a lot of consumer tech clients and uh, some FMCG. Our sweet spot is where we can work direct with brands, but we still do a lot of agency work and um, support their production needs. Uh, so just going to show you one uh, piece here quickly, which is a H&M um, film. This is just the 15 seconds, so it's not long. But this um, shoot was, was a great shoot for us. Um, it was a fantastic video. It was a great story. We got to work with a great soundtrack. And we're ultimately two of the KOLs from the film got to re-record the soundtrack. And um, we even got to do a Chinese version. So uh, I'll play the film first. And... So everyone loved this campaign, brand loved it, agency loved it, and um, we we're all super happy with it. And obviously it's a great soundtrack. Uh, but then the problem with this campaign is a week after it was released, China cancels H&M because of their involvement with the Cotton Council and the, and the um, hubris around Xinjiang. So um, this is just a really important um, aspect, I guess, of working in China is that, you know, Politics and business, um, unfortunately, are pretty closely related. And it just means that we need to be super sensitive about um, how we work and who we're working with. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, we can be on the receiving end of this as a production company. So it's, uh, it's just a byproduct of the environment. But, um, you know, there's also a lot of upside. Uh, again, it's not just restricted to brand. Um, I think something that has been a recent trend lately is cracking down on, on celebrities, on fake fans, on tax evasion. So a lot of celebrities have been cancelled in China. And when they cancel people in China, they don't just cancel them. They like literally wipe them off social media. So again, you know, if, if we've had campaigns where we were going to work with a celebrity and the celebrity got cancelled, so the whole project got, got, um, got sidelined or they had to find a replacement. And then... Um, you know, we just need to be aware of what's going on. Also for casting regular people, you know, there's been a lot of perceptions about, about Chinese, um, you know, what is a pure China and so on and so on. When I first came, a lot of brands wanted to work with Western people. They wanted foreign models because it was seen as being luxury and aspirable, attainable. Um, but really the past couple of years, uh, it's about, you know, China for China. And we, we've always tried to advocate using Chinese models for Chinese fashion brands or even for local campaigns. Um, there still were uh, some brands wanting to use uh, foreign models, but, but we're seeing it less so now. What's interesting about these two examples here is on, on the left is I Am What I Am, which was an animation, Chinese produced animation, where the characters, uh, the netizens felt that 
there were two Chinese. And again, a very uh, beautiful image by Chen Nan for Dior, where this got a lot of criticism online for per perpetuating Chinese stereotypes. Now, to the Western eye, these people, um, or the woman on the right, they're beautiful, you know, they're all individual. And it's interesting where in the West, there's this, this trend towards diversity and, and, you know, being woke. In China, there is this very sense of what a what a Chinese how Chinese people need to be represented, and uh, it's something that we need to obviously uh, be aware of as a production company, as a content creator. Uh, so the question is, studio or no studio? Um, well, we got plans to to hopefully open up another space later this year, but right now it's actually been a bit of a bit a bit of a liberating feeling not to have to worry about a big studio facility. Obviously it keeps the overheads down, but um, it also gives us flexibility because we're, you know, really a good part of our shoots, 50, more than 50% of our shoots, we'd, we'd be shooting on location or we'd have to go somewhere else. And uh, it gives us the flexibility, not only to shoot anywhere, but it gives us the flexibility to work with uh, a different medium. And uh, this is an animation we did for Laura Piana. And not only do we get to work with a different medium, but we also get to work with a whole range of different creators. And this one was for Chinese New Year, where we worked with Heckler Singapore for the animation. We worked with a local Chinese artist and um, Heckler Australia also did the soundtrack. So this is a little glimpse into our new office. And um, it's a nice airy space. It feels good to come to work. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where we are or where we should, but it's all about the assets. And we're really uh, all about asset creation for our clients and customers. And uh, we look to expand more, um, you know, in the future to be working more with, with uh, the effects and digital assets and really looking into the new trends without being bound to having the studio. Thank you. Thanks, Rodney. Um, very insightful. Um, obviously, a big transition over the years, and you've had to pivot a few times. Uh, obviously, it's another continuing change when you when you battle uh, culture, politics, and those sorts of things. And uh, I I wish you well in your your future endeavours. Um, but yeah, a different insight from from certainly uh, the rest of us, uh, I guess, who who work and live outside China. So thank you for that. Um, we've got a short break now. Um, it's time for those who wish to interact with the sponsors to go by the exhibition tab. So if you go to the section there to the exhibition tab, you can connect with some fellow creative operations people in the lounge as well and have a chit chat with other people that are at the event today. Um, and uh, I invite you then to uh, further to that to continue on and watch the, uh, the tracks uh, that are going to be running in around about uh, 20, 25 minutes time. Thanks very much and uh, we'll Thank see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.